the reality is the future is now. It's like the biggest problems in the food system right now, which will be the biggest problems in the future tomorrow, are those dealing with the fact that people who work the hardest can, in the food system, can barely make ends meet. Sanjay Rawal is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Sanjay is a James Beard award-winning filmmaker. He made the movie documentary Food Chains, which was with Eva Longoria and Eric Lusser, which chronicled the battle of the coalition of Imo Pali workers, a small group of Oaxacan and Chiapan indigenous farm workers in Florida against the largest agribusiness conglomerates in the world. The film was released theatrically in a number of countries and won numerous awards, including citations from the US Conference of Mayors, the Clinton Global Initiative, and the White House. The film was also a winner of the 2016 BitDoc Impact Award and several other festival prizes. Sanjay's last film, 3100 Run and Become, won several festival prizes, had a robust theatrical release in the US in 2018, and is opening in traditional theater theatrical engagements across Europe and Australia in 2020 and 2021. I just want you to know that I probably slaughtered those indigenous names. Uh, and uh, Sanjay, I'm glad I have you on the show to correct me and make sure any misgivings of my horrible pronunciations are fixed. But welcome to the show. I'm so glad you're here. Mark, it's great to join you. Thank you for having me. Did I, did I horribly mess up those names? Well, you know, we, we live and learn. <laughs> so you've been doing this for quite some time, have some wonderful uh, accolades and, and uh, doing something very dear and near to, to my heart, um, food, food topics, um, especially with indigenous people and in nature, kind of the reconnecting of uh, the, the historical views of how food was processed and, and how over the years that we've kind of just found worldwide, globally, in all forms that if we cut food off from people, that's really the biggest way to, to, to bring them to their knees. And, and we've done it uh, in, your, in your film, Gather You, you so... Um, nicely show how horrible we've treated indigenous people around the world and especially Native Americans. Um, uh, and we've used food to kind of treat them horribly as well. I um, want to start out first with all this experience that you have. Did it help you weather this pandemic, this crazy times, Black Lives Matter, um, all the inauguration, all the craziness we've had in the world, did it give you any resilience? How have you weathered this time? Well, so this is a, a great question and it, it, it'll allow me to frame, I think a lot of our conversation. In a nutshell, there's a small health food store, a natural food store around the corner from me where I live in Queens, New York City. And 15 years ago, there were no Whole Foods. Amazon didn't deliver in a day. Um, there were a lot more grocery options, particularly grocery options for communities that wanted a little agency of their own health. I live in a majority minority neighborhood and probably a, a very underserved low income neighborhood, um, demographically speaking. There's a lot of ancestral knowledge and this little health food store called Guru Health Foods was really literally a lifeline for this community, which was one of the hardest hit in the entire world. Uh, the store has herbs, it has organic food, and it's there to provide a community service. And I'm going to jump from that little pinpoint to like, 
a million foot like lunar observation. I think people should, should keep in mind that this modern system of extracting foods from one part of the world and shipping them thousands of miles away to where they might be worth a heck of a lot more really only began with the spice trade. Corporations were set up backed by governments to travel to the far east and literally raid islands for their spices. In the meantime, as part of that whole global expedition, they, uh, European uh, conquerors, colonists came across Turtle Island, North America, the Western hemisphere, and they figured out, particularly the Anglo-European explorers, they figured out that the value of Turtle Island was in the topsoil. And they quickly developed agricultural cash crops akin to spices, cotton and uh, tobacco specifically. And that created this whole system that we now have exported all over the world, where people go to supermarkets, big box stores, get things that were grown very far away. And in many cases, in communities that get very, very, very little equity. They get very, very few dollars compared to the sales price. Along the way, the way this, this system was pioneered was really to the detriment of local indigenous communities, first in North America and then all over the world to the degree where for many farmers internationally, it's much more economical to grow things not tailored for local market. So when we in the developed world beget, begin to look at food issues, we have to realize that capitalism has created a series of haves and have nots. And to tie it back to my, my initial kind of personal anecdote, when there are shocks to this global supply chain system, whether they're economic, or pandemic related. What ends up happening is that those who can afford food experience very little interruption, very little lack of access, very little lack of choice, but communities that don't underpin the economics of that system, like my neighborhood in Queens, find themselves in dire straits. So during the pandemic, this little health food store had an extraordinarily difficult time with its suppliers, the same suppliers who deliver to Whole Foods and other natural food conglomerates. And it just showed me that every single food issue is local. And until we find ways to circulate local dollars within local systems, no one is going to be safe from future shock. So the, this past week, I've had a couple of people on the podcast who've, who've written books, who one what uh, started the D DC uh, Central Kitchen, um, uh, Robert Egger, and also uh, Dr. Uh, Katie Martin, who just finished the book, Reinventing Food Banks and Food Pantries. The topic of food is a big issue, uh, started really last year on, on an international basis with the United Nations coming forward and saying they're going to do the UN Food System Summit and um, just really trying to push awareness and that's been moved now to this year. Um, the, the movie or the documentary that we really got you here for today to speak to us is Gather, which came out during the pandemic, you know, uh, fall of 2020 uh, about Native Americans. And um, I, I know how it is to release a book, a documentary, and extreme difficulties during a pandemic when you're used to a system that's normally, you know, uh, movie theaters or screenings and release uh, premieres or events. Um, how, how did that all go? Can you tell us a little bit more, not just on how maybe how that process worked, but then we'll, we'll go more into the, the documentary itself, but just that process of, you know, doing something around food, around the, the food insecurity, the food sovereignty, the issues in, in that whole area, you're trying to release it during a pandemic. Well, that, I'm very lucky. Like I have a great team. And at the beginning of the pandemic, March, February, March, April, 2020, it was clear from our own personal habits that we were all watching a lot more 
content than ever before. And at the same time, a lot of these content providers had ordered their slate for 2020 already and didn't necessarily have the ability to rapidly create new programs. Obviously, those programs couldn't be produced during the pandemic. So we realized that there was a tremendous opportunity. People were looking for content that was positive. You know, if our movie was about like murderers and torturers, you know, it's not the kind of uh, yeah. film that folks wanted to watch. At the same time, we do touch on very, very deep topics, particularly critical theory around race. And our film came out in September 2020 in the US and Canada uh, digitally. And um, this was just after the summer of the, the kind of renewed focus on Black Lives Matter, George Floyd's murder, Ahmed Aubrey's murder, Breonna Taylor's murder. And we were able to basically connect the Black Lives Matter movement with native resiliency in the sense that this agricultural system that we spoke about a, minute, a few minutes ago, uh, the colonial system of, of um, of cash crops, as people know, required um, the brutal enslavement of people from West Africa who were primarily agricultural experts. And last summer's series of protests really educated people on the legacy of slavery within institutions in the US today, from you know loan systems, redlining, to, of course, law enforcement. But we made the case that the obverse of that coin of labor in the original agricultural economy was land. That land was not unoccupied. It was not wilderness. It was a careful interconnected series of Native American farms and harvesting and foraging areas to the degree that now 70% of the variety in global food came from scientists in the Western hemisphere from indigenous people, from corn to a lot of beans, to potatoes, to tomatoes. What I think of as my ancestral food in East India, potatoes, tomatoes, even capsaicin didn't exist in any form whatsoever until the British brought those foodstuffs over in the 1700s. The San Marzano tomato, which underpins Southern Italian cuisine didn't actually hit mainland Italy until 1770. So as people were beginning to understand the inequity that create the conditions for African Americans in the US from a, a structural standpoint, our film provided the other half of that. And we we were shocked by the interest. We only we created the movie primarily for indigenous audiences. But when non-natives, particularly those people in the food system, wanted to understand the depths of inequity. Um, again, those of us in the food system don't have any connection or bear any responsibility for the horrors of the past, but a lot of the problems in the food system are due really around, around the world are due to the original inequity that caused, that created the supply chain system in America, the land Absolutely. issues, the labor issues, and that's been exported all over the world. Absolutely. That's uh, so true. And I mean, that's kind of why I asked you that the, the first question, you know, you, you with food chains and with your dealings with James Beard and, and, and dealing with food over the years and do your documentaries and things that you've done, um, that, you know, there's a lot of discussion, food insecurity, food sovereignty, you know, how, how does this whole system uh, work and function, the, the inequalities, the uh, enormous race issue in the entire system and then this pandemic this black lives matters and and uh, inauguration and many global unrest happen um that maybe I, I was hoping some of those experiences or those moments where you said we're, we're trying to uncover this injustice or what's been going on um so long that we're we're starting to learn what some models of resilience could be and how to apply them that maybe occurred during this pandemic. 
for me, on, on the flip side, what I've seen is this bigger global view where we, we had another crazy thing that happened as, as the Brexit, obviously, we, that we really couldn't believe, but all the, that combined with a lockdown and the enormous amount of migrant workers that go every year into the United Kingdom to harvest, produce, and sell the foods that they make um, showed us, oh my gosh, how big a problem we have around the world in the, our global food systems. And I was just wondering if there's any more learning lessons from this time that you can give us or depart to us. So Gather is based on the concept of food sovereignty, which is a much deeper idea than food access or food security. Food security is the, the, the availability of calories at an affordable cost. Food sovereignty is a community's exercising of rights to have the types of food that they want. Many times we only really see food sovereignty in play in immigrant communities in developed nations um, that have little tiny stores that somehow exist and they're affordable. But on a larger scale, and this is what I, I, I explored in my first movie, and it's something that half of the food world doesn't pay any attention to, and the other half, thankfully, pays all attention to it, is the value of human beings. Food sovereignty requires community. Food security just requires a truck and a road and ability to get whatever quality food to a particular location. When it comes to food sovereignty, we don't just have to think about the producers, we have to think about the people that are working in the fields, that are working within the meatpacking plants, that are working in the grocery system, that are working in the supply chain. Because if any, if, if any one of those nodes experiences any sort of shock, an entire system is turned upside down. So a great example of food sovereignty in a non-native setting is our communities in Detroit, who about 10 or 15 years ago began to realize that they were not getting access to food. And at the same time, there was a lot of unused land in their lower income neighborhoods um, that was abandoned, but still under the aegis of the city of Detroit. Uh, local folks, you know, pressured the government pretty significantly to be able to take over those empty tracts of land and to grow and harvest food. And so what happens there when an entire community relies on itself to be the supply chain is you develop an understanding of everyone's role in that community. You know who's doing what. So to extrapolate from that, what, what I think most of us realized during the pandemic is that were it not for strong local food systems, we would have been stuffed. And that might have included, you know, the person making meals in their house and distributing them to seniors. It might have been the local natural food store that was willing to deliver it to seniors, unlike the big box stores. We began to realize how many people in our community work on the food system and how we need to really understand and value that and build a reliance. Once we have that concept you know, front of mind, we can begin to figure out how to channel more of our dollars into that local food system. At the end of the day, the cost on taxpayers is so much greater for supporting big box stores for the lower prices that you might get you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. The externalities end up killing us. For example, in the United States, you know, we've, got, we've got Walmart, as do a number of countries. Walmart half of their workforce or more are recipients of government aid. And so the prices for consumers are cheap there because their labor costs are negligible. At the same time, the same people buying that food end up paying for the subsidies for that labor force to get food stamps and other government aid. At the same time, that sort of big system is as far away from local as possible. So we need to understand how to make our dollars work within communities and how invaluable those personal bonds are with everybody in our local food system. Absolutely so true. And, and I, I want to really get more into, into gather, um, kind of step back. I originally heard from a, a mutual friend of ours, Diane Hatch. She said, you've got to see 
this new documentary, Gather, and uh, she said there's a, a, um, a, a segment or a piece from Trevor Noah and Jason Momoa where they talk a little bit about it. And I know Jason Momoa is the executive producer on it, uh, although I don't believe he appears in, in, in the documentary at all, but um, just kind of raising the awareness. And, and so, you, as you said earlier, you definitely have um, very fortunate to, to, to get it out to the right people and, and um, hear this. I, I went and watched it. I watched it twice, as a matter of fact. And um, I, I have to be honest, I was shocked. I was devastated. I, I've lived in, in uh, on close and, and on reservations before as a, as a white American from, from New York, but it wasn't in New York. It was in, um, in uh, Roosevelt, Utah, matter of fact, with um, an indigenous native tribes and seeing some of the things that was de depicted in and gather. And I don't want to be the big spoiler alert or give everything away. I want people to go out and watch it for themselves. But not only did it properly de depict the, the true situation um, that I even saw when I was younger in, in, in those Native Americans, but it just really, to me, almost depicted how how the US, how the world has destroyed our indigenous and native populations and really left them in a really <laughs> uh, uh, hurtful way on, on how they eat, where they get their food, their lands, the, the way it's done. You know, there's a scene um, that's even shown in your trailer of all the buffalo heads and, and, and where they talk about that. Um, you, you did an excellent job but I'm telling you, it, it, it was so real and scary for me. It was as all it was scary for me because how can it be that bad? I mean, it just was for me. I I, I felt like, you know, I've I heard I've heard Trump talk and I've seen some crazy things, but for me, this was like the as real and crazy as it could get. Uh, um, how bad these Native Americans were were in a situation they were in. Well, you know, it, it, it all really started in the Crusades. It started again, you know, a few hundred years later in the 1400s with this concept of the doctrine of discovery, which basically allowed Catholic explorers to kill non-Catholics for their land and their resources effectively. It didn't exactly say that, but that it, the, the latter was justified by, by this doctrine. And so that created the conditions where these Catholic kingdoms and then Christian kingdoms to would, would, would literally hire ship captains and, and ships and, and send those ships all over the world to find wealth. I mean, it's, it was literally one of the first forms of modern venture capitalism. You know, John Cabot, one of the England's main explorers, wasn't English at all. He was Italian. You know, the Portuguese and the Spanish hired a lot of Italians, including Christopher Columbus, to, to head out, you know, and, and explore and bring back wealth. And those explorers would get a stake in that wealth, but they were being funded by these large nation states. And so the idea was money. The Spanish were very cruel, but, you know, they were looking for, for gold. Um, the Portuguese were looking for gold. It was only the, the Anglo-Europeans that realized that the value in North America was in the topsoil. And to their dismay, you know, or actually to, to their surprise, you know, there was a lot of already cultivated land on the Eastern seaboard. Um, to their dismay, it was populated. And so thus began a series of exterminations supported by the British military to the effect that by 1763, the farmers of the American colonies had so depleted the topsoil on the Eastern seaboard that they asked for royal permission to cross the Appalachian mountains. Now, why would they need permission? They didn't really need permission, but they needed the British military to support that venture because they were going to steal more native land. Now the, you, the British military and the British government didn't have the money or the interest in that and you know, put forth this royal decree banning the settlement of the areas west of the Appalachians. And that created the Revolutionary War. 
that concept, you know, was the underpinning of the expansion of the United States, you know, pushing not, not so much killing natives anymore as the British did, but sending them west of the Mississippi, putting them on reservations, force marching them to places that were undesirable for American farming. But again, it's like those lands west of the Mississippi by the 1860s, 1870s, you know, were essential to supporting a new form of American immigration. Again, all the money was land-based. We're not even at the Industrial Revolution yet. If you wanted to make money, you had to grow stuff. To the degree that by 1920, the third largest carbon sink in the world, the plains, the Great Plains, were turned into monocropped farmland, which was such an unsustainable way of, of supporting that land that it created a dust bowl. So the, the, these disasters were all initiated by the destruction of native ways of life. That said, what we focus on and gather is the, the reality that despite a history of genocide, a history of devastation, many native communities still have kept their ancestral songs, their ancestral practices, even if they're living on land where their ancestors didn't live, if they were forced off their ancestral land onto reservations, they're keeping the concept of stewardship and they're reviving localized food systems. Because the last bit of it all is that natives were pushed so far away from the supply chain that, and into many areas that are unfarmable, that they receive the worst quality food at the highest prices. They still subsist on effectively what were military rations, bags of flour, bags of sugar, bags of salt, bottles of oil, and it's created a health epidemic in Indian country. Our film focuses on a handful of people, and there's many more than just those in our film, but focuses on a handful of people in Indian country that are revitalizing those traditions and building a food system of tomorrow. Yeah, that handful of people is, is absolutely right. There, there, there are more, but um, even when we look at some of those handful of indigenous uh, tribes and, and nations in in the United States, um, they're definitely not what they used to be, and they've had a hard road to to sow over all these years, many trials and tribulations, and we have definitely not made um, the food systems, uh, food security, food sovereignty, uh, an easy road or easy way to go for them at all. I see a, a lot of a lot of things that. Uh, really need to be not only the paradigm needs to be shifted but brought to awareness but to kind of give back and and, and make right or help um, them restore those indigenous traditional ways and and help them be further promoted and, and, and used more often that's why um, in, in some respects I tickled on those two authors uh, and super people around some new systems even emerging and developing around food banks, pantries, and central kitchens to th that are almost systems that that could possibly be of help to to bring back uh, pride and, and, and this uh, sovereignty back into those areas uh, and the bring back the traditions, give back lands, allow fishing and, and different things that you also address and gather that, that really need a change. And I see it changing in non-reservation areas um, so, so that it's being restored and we're, we're kind of coming to a better system, but it really needs to occur for everyone and we need to remove this huge race barrier. Um, but there are some tools on the Gather Film website, there's availability to do screenings. To, there's availability to go there and and get some resources. What are the main messages and things that you would like people to do um, before, after, and during they they see this movie, so to say? What 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 your objectives and why's? So I I, I imagine that. This podcast has a global audience, not just in, in the US and Canada. Yes. But there are, we'll call them first people. There are communities of first people in every country. And 
they can be identified by their connection to their land in Europe as well, uh, their connection to their land, their existence depending on a very, very deep knowledge of, that e of their ecosystems. They don't just have to be practicing non-Christian religions. Um, a lot of Native Americans are Christian. So the, the way to identify where these communities exist are basically to, to, to see which folks are super tied to the land. And obviously not all will identify as indigenous, but very often those communities are the ones that are first hit by potential environmental disasters. They're the canaries in the coal mine, so to speak. They're the ones who are fighting against oil extraction, fighting against unjust mining, fighting against the building of rickety pipelines. And for those of us who live far away from those communities, we might ask, you know, how does that concern me? But most of these communities have a larger view than just their own little ecosystems. They feel a, a sense of stewardship towards their land and towards all of Earth. And for example, a lot of folks will know about the, the Standing Rock um, Sioux Reservation in North Dakota and the yeah. mass protest and fight against the pipelines uh, a few years back. Now, the pipelines would have crossed that reservation and would have potentially impacted the Missouri River, which has millions of people living downstream. One of the tenets behind the protest was not just that uh, an oil pipe um, bursting would affect the local lands, but it would pollute the water system all the way down the Missouri. And that would have an impact on tens of millions of people's lives. And so that little fight began to be understood by people in much larger cities downriver um, understanding that if the systems up north weren't secured, and, and this company has had a history of, of, of um, leakages, and since the pipeline had been installed, there, there were you know, problems even on the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation. A lot of these kind of frontline communities, I'll say, have policy goals. And so this is the answer to your question. Find out what those policy goals, find out who the people most rooted to your land are and find out what they're fighting for. Um, don't go in with your great grand ideas, particularly if you live near an indigenous community, um, a truly indigenous community that's been there for hundreds, if not thousands of years, practicing their own way of life. Understand what's important to them and try to see if they need us outsiders to be allies because chances are those policy issues will have a deep impact on your life. Now, Gather focuses on a handful of characters. We've got a chef from the White Mountain Apache tribe in Eastern Arizona, Nephi Craig, uh, a, a, a female forager named Twyla Casador from a little further south in Arizona, um, young scientist on the Lakota Reservation in uh, the Shrine River Lakota Reservation in South Dakota named Elsie Dubray, and a group of young men on the border of California and Oregon on a gigantic river, the Yurok Nation on the, on the river of the, called the Klamath. Now the Klamath River has a series of dams that have been there for decades, ostensibly to provide hydroelectric power, but it costs too much to upkeep those dams. And those dams have destroyed the river and have really impacted the way farmers use water because in some sections there's an there's unlimited access, which is not good, you know, in this modern sense. Water is so precious, it needs to be used in, as, 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 as specifically as possible. So these young men, you know, as shown in the movie, you know, have finally been able to help secure the demolition of those dams. And this will have impacts throughout the, the, the California agricultural system. It'll be difficult because, you know, at first, there isn't gonna be the same unlimited access to this water, but it's gonna force the whole system to rethink water usage. And it's going to deeply increase the health of hundreds of thousands of acres of forest systems, which will hopefully prevent the next decades, you know, crop of wildfires. That, that leads me to a real unique um, question. And I'd like to see how um, <clears throat> you answer it. In, in this, we're talking about indigenous 
tribes, natives. Um, we're talking about those who aren't first peoples who are, uh, although probably maybe have also multi-generations lived there as well, but aren't first peoples and, and living in a different situation. How do you feel about the the term or the the uh, the sense of being a global citizen in a world without nations, borders, divisions of humanity, one from each other, not cultures, but these divisions and borders that we've had. So we've in this lockdown in this period of, of COVID and, and, and pandemic, we've, we've been confined more as humans, but air has been a global citizen, food's been a global citizen, species have been a global citizen. How does that tie into not only gather, but also this, this kind of the wisdom you shared with us on how we go in, try, try to help and see if that's even needed or wanted? I mean, we, we, we see that the most powerful social movements really of the last century or more are the ones who've united people based on socioeconomic class. You know, if there wasn't this horrific engine of money making that has crisscrossed the world and literally created the supply chain, which just extracts value from one community and sends it to another, there wouldn't be the global inequity that there is now. You know, obviously it's like that supply chain is also transferred knowledge, it's transferred culture, but looking at the precarious situation that we're in, there isn't a single place on earth that's devoid of culture, that's devoid of spirituality. So we don't really need to, you know, to, to look at how to protect those issues necessarily, but the world has been divided by class. And the great travesty is that people have been pitted, people of the same class have been pitted against each other through artificial politics, through an artificial, you know, campaign to control emotions and to sow this division. But when you look at, you know, the Black Panthers, when you look at it, Reverend Barber in, the, in North Carolina and, and the, the, the poor people's movement, when you look at Martin Luther King's work, when you even look at, at you know, the work of like Subhash Chandra Bose and, and India's freedom fighters, it was very much collecting people against a power that exerted itself by controlling economics and controlling the supply chain. And so there's room for all of us in this movement who understand that the overlords aren't simply motivated by politics or ideology. At the root, it's economics. And they might justify their economics through ideology or religion the same way that the the colonizers did, but at the end of the day, you know, most of us who aren't of that class have very, very similar goals that can coexist. You you said it and it really hit the the nail on the head. Um, it really all comes back down to economics in, in many respects. That uh, where we decide to make divisions or find racial issues or to try to disrupt or uh, displace or hurt people who maybe don't fit into the system somehow. And um, I, I speak a lot about sustainability and environment. I'm really big on indigenous peoples uh, uh, and that. And some people, you know, think sustainability or an environmentalist or an activist you know, as a tree hugger, earth lover, you know, hippie, whatever, whatever it may be. But really, it comes down to three things with sustainability. It comes first and foremost, you have to be very wise with economics. What is a, a sustainable economic model that will run and work in the future for everyone? That's a model that needs to work for everyone. Uh, you're a futurist. You think about the future. What's the future health of our planet and humanity going to be. And the last one is you really have to think about uh, wisdom and I, or innovation. And I think in, in innovation, I think a lot about indigenous wisdom as some of the best innovations I've seen, even at the, uh, at the World Economic Forum stage where 
we've seen people who are suffering or been in a certain situation come up with new models that are very innovative based on old wisdom to get us into new situations. And I, um, after seeing Gather uh, uh, both times, I just really felt strongly how besides what, what we're already hearing going on, the United Nations Food System Summit, uh, James Beard, the Eat Forum, um, all, all the different food movements and food awareness, the food tribes that are going on in the world. How do we really get a food system uh, or food systems reform that will work for everyone? What, what do you have some, I, I, I'm, I know I'm giving you the big question, but I really want your wisdom and learning to see how we, what we need to do, where we need to be looking in the right area. I think I think the first question is, and 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 you know this is, you know the exact opposite of what you've dedicated yourself to is that when we listen to these ideas, do we want to possess them? Because there are just as many people at these forums that have an interest in commodifying these ideas. And we see this notably in the regenerative agriculture movement for all of the, the indigenous wisdom and local wisdom and deep knowledge underpinning it. There's a class of people that are selling the content that are making a lot of money on it. And at the same time, that's not a bad thing, but we also see that the money makers don't include indigenous voices or longtime experts in their leadership. Um, there's a conversation right now to allow diversity. And it's not necessarily leadership. We should be looking at communities that have the most, the, the deepest stake, the deepest knowledge to be leaders for the rest of us. But for the most part, the people that are leaders are the ones that have access to money in the food system that have the financial wherewithal to like fly to Davos or fly to Geneva and participate in this global circuit of speaking. Whereas the people doing the hard work that are suffering are those that are right now protesting in Delhi. You know, it's like, I haven't seen a New York Times article where they basically allow the people on those front lines to speak about the movement in their own voices. You know, that's the thing, it's like, if we want a food system of equality, we have to look at who's represented in all of these conversations, not just tokenizing people, putting them on a stage, but actually putting them in positions of leadership and understanding, I think at the fundamental level that institutions don't make people experts in the food system. So just because a female farmer you know, in India doesn't have a degree from Oxford, doesn't mean that she doesn't have ideas on how to effectively change the food system. We would, in, in the institutional framework, we would never consider a woman like that to be the head of the food and agriculture organization. But maybe folks like that are the ones that need to be in those positions. I totally agree. We have, a, 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 I believe, a mutual friend, and he was also on the show, Lauren Cardelli, yeah. and uh, he says hello, by the way, and um, he uh, also brought up this topic. There, there will be uh, many protesters there um, at the UN Food System Summit that are just feeling that their voice is not at the table, that there's not true representation, but also that... Um, we're giving, giving the stage or the voices to sometimes the wrong people. And so I love that you, you brought that up because there needs to be that equality. There needs to be a strong indigenous voice there. And we need to, to have those, exactly those voices of, of the um, female farmers from India. Um, matter of fact, the majority of the world's farmers and food harvest, harvesters are women and girls. And um, they definitely need to have a voice in this, not to just bring them into uh, a gender equality, but to give them a fair wage, to, to, to give them a dignity of an education, to give them land and uh, micro loans like uh, Muhammad Yunus giving his Grameen Bank and the microcredits um, 
that he does, we need to um, make sure that whether they're um, introverted or they're not educated or whoever, that they, everyone has a voice at the table on food. And you don't need, uh, this is my biggest mantra, is you don't really need the degrees or to be the scientist or to be the long-term farmer Joe food producer for Nestle or Unilever to have a voice at the table because um, food is our energy source. We've been, it's the longest, oldest running economy in the world. It's been around for 13,000 years, 12,000 years. Uh, it's the most successful, longest running economy we've ever had. Um, but it's also the least paid, the least digitized, the biggest employer of women and girls, the biggest cause of human suffering and greenhouse gas emissions and our global grand challenges regardless of just the ones that uh, you're talking about and gather of, of racial inequality and, and um, indigenous inequality for uh, of access and, and what's going on um, that you address or you speak about and shed the light on and gather. We really need some fixings. And so I, I when, when you mentioned that, my, my heart just rings because it's, uh, uh, it's such, such needed voices. I, I, I not necessarily want to bring those voices to the UN or to the World Economic Forum, which are, could be seen as elitist clubs, but how can we give them empowerment? How can we do more to, um, to reach that critical mass so that we can start to see these effective changes happening globally, as well as in, for Native Americans in the US? That, that's a very big question. And obviously the, the solutions are gonna be different community by community. I, I think it's an understanding that any weakness in the food system, any inequity in the food system will rear its ugly head and haunt those of us who think that we're insulated. There is going to be a reckoning. There is a reckoning right now. And the way to effectively support that is to support all the wonderful legitimate movements out there. It's like everyone in the food system should be talking about what's happening in India right now. Everyone should be talking about like the health of meatpacking workers in like Nebraska where the COVID restrictions are, are non-existent. Everyone should be talking about how to support the, the food community in Texas right now. It's like the world is so global, but when there are problems around the world that seem like they're millions of miles away, it's out of sight, out of mind. Simply because of ignorance, we have no idea how much we're reliant on markets all over the world. For those of us who live you know, in the modern food system, whether we're in the developing world or the developed world. If we live in an urban area or semi-urban area and we don't grow our own food, you're dependent on people who could be thousands of miles away from you. And so that's just to say that shocks in the supply chain can have long lasting effects for people who don't think that they're, to, for, to people who think that they're insulated from it. And, and that, that's the main thing. It's like, you know, we should focus on supporting change in every local community that wants specific local changes. I agree. I agree. That's that's beautiful advice. I have probably this is probably the most difficult question that I have for you today. It's also very big and, and hard to answer question, but it's the burning question WTF and it's not the swear word, although I'm sure we've all been pulling our hair thinking that uh, since the pandemic and with many other injustices going on in the world, but it's what's the future. I mean, it's a great question. The reality is the future is now. It's like the biggest problems in the food system right now, which will be the biggest problems in the future tomorrow are those dealing with the fact that people who work the hardest can, in the food system can barely make ends meet. You know, it's like, yes, climate change is an issue. 
But the way the global food system has worked the last 20 years is wherever there's environmental issues, lack of rainfall, less predictable stuff, the food system just moves. And it finds land that can support this type of, of, of um, economy or this type of production. And it finds local people. Very often, because of the economics of food, those local people aren't paid very much. Those, those land costs are, are very minimal. Uh, national governments are pressured or incentivized to support you know, the, 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 the movement of the global food system. But what ends up happening is five or 10 years later, we see the inequity in that food system from a labor standpoint. And those people begin to rise up, whether they're farm workers in Mexico in Bristol supply chain, whether they're the coalition of Immokalee workers, uh, tomato pickers in Southern Florida, whether they're the farm, farmers and farm workers in India, whether they're meatpacking workers, et cetera. It's like the problems in our food system that create the most degree, the highest degree of unsustainability is the fact that it's not sustainable right now for people to harvest food, to produce food, to help the rest of us, you know, achieve the type of lifestyles that we want to. This kind of, the, there's a couple of things that you said earlier, but also what this ties into, you know, there's the buzzword obviously around regenerative, regenerative or, uh, or, or organics and uh, some new different certifications and, and kind of movements in that direction. Um, is there, are we talking about a more regenerative system or a more regenerative economy in a sense for those food workers, one that can go on indefinitely? Or are we only talking about just better working conditions and um, how, how their jobs work? I want, I want to dive a little bit deeper into that. That's a great question. I think, I think the, the, the question needs to be posed to the people. I can't think of many workers on the ground that care if they're in a on a regenerative farm or not. Most, none of those definitions impact how big of a jerk your boss is going to be. They, they don't impact the high degree of sexual violence that exists in agriculture. They, they don't impact the low wages. One of the biggest issues I have with the regenerative system is Farmers, for the most part, except for rare collectives, but this isn't in the definition of regenerative farming, regenerative farmers are still at the mercy of the supply chain. They still have to make ends meet. They still have to pay property taxes. They're still kind of fighting the same forces um, that move them into regenerative farming in the first place. It's not necessarily the best condition for workers. There's no guidance for those farmers on how to really you know, ensure the highest standard of conditions for everybody within their system. They don't have enough money to have HR departments and to Im implement a lot of like kind of government mandated guidelines. So again, it's like, I would like to talk about labor more than the environment. You know, we in the West generally or in the developed world generally tend to fixate on climate change and not labor. It's much more sexy for progressives to talk about climate change than to advocate for the unionization of workers. Um, they should go hand in hand. They're equally important. Um, and so I, I would just push more people in the food movement to think about the actual system. You know, it's not just dependent on earth, it's dependent on people. And that's where the division is. You know, we tend to think that we're superior to people that are of a different color, of a different socioeconomic background. And we tend to think that we can exist without them. We tend to think that if the global temperatures dropped, everything would be fine, yeah. but it would be. Uh, you, and and tell, tell me if I'm wrong, but I think you really touched a, more about that labor and about that in the food chain, uh, in your documentary, the food chain as well, not only picking tomatoes and this uh, migrant workforce and, and just a, a really horrific conditions in that that really need to be changed. And also when I mentioned, you know, kind of the the migrant workers with the Brexit, but that's going on all around the world where we 
uh, tend to forget the huge reliance upon these migrant workers who are picking and growing and, and planting and harvesting, transporting and processing this food um, for us all around the world. And they're not being paid a fair wage. And, and um, they're, they can even go further. We can, I mean, we could go even to more. The other thing that you touched upon is how food uh, from in 2008 was all made into a commodity through the financial crisis and what ripple effects that's had on those migrant workers, on the workers in the food industry period. And, and it's taken food and made it into a commodity, which is when you cheapen food, you cheapen life, so to say. I, mean, I, I, th I think the biggest thing, and this, is, this, this sounds dumb, is that people not be jerks, you know, to those in the yeah. food system. Not, neither ignoring them, neither patronizing them understanding that if you go to a supermarket you are intertwined with a complex set of layers of production and transportation each of which depends on transportation each of which depends on on human beings more often than not those human beings are at a lower socioeconomic level than the end consumer um, and that shouldn't create a sense of superiority in us to the degree that we should realize that the solutions to those people's problems exist within their communities. So when they're advocating for specific change, it's not enough for us to say like, oh, but here's the change that I think would be better. It's up to us to have oneness with them and to support their change or to support their, their, their campaigns with the realization that the better off human beings are in the food system, the better off the rest of us will be. And that includes people who aren't in the food system at all. I mean, or who aren't in the supply chain. When we look at issues that we talk about in Gather, like in Indian country, in Native American reservations, they have a completely different set of governance by the United, State, United States government than farmers. You know, they're under the Bureau of Indian Affairs. They're under the Secretary of the Interior. They don't have the massive resources of the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture. They don't have access to capital. They don't have all of the elements that any food producer needs to be part of the supply chain. So it's two parts. People in those communities, whether they're Native American or African American or rural white communities, they need to have the same tools that much more wealthy elements of the food chain have. But number two, if they wish to exist outside that food system, they should be able to. There's, there's been a, a devastating clawback of African-American owned farming land in the South and in, in, in the Midwest. Um, there's also been a clawback a lot of a lot of Native American land and the appropriation of that for mining or other extractive industries. And that affects hyperlocal food systems. The way we justify it as non-natives is that those areas aren't in production for the greater food system. And so why couldn't they be used for energy production? Whereas their value is to local people. Those pieces of land support local food systems that aren't connected with the supply chain. So it's, it's all twofold. It's number one, it's understanding that those of us who don't have to grow our own food or harvest our own food are in a place of privilege no matter what our socioeconomic level is, and that we rely on the hands and hearts of millions of other people, and we have to meet them on their level. Yeah, we, we really, um, you, you mean, you started out and saying, you know, this might be stupid or dumb, and it's absolutely not. It's really what I hear out of, of what you said. It's almost the golden rule, you know, treat people on planet how you would want to be treated and, and how you want to be treated. And it's really kind of, um, it, even though we definitely do have this racism and this class separation uh, of, you know, uh, that's really what, what needs to change. Those communities and, and those uh, areas where they're saying, hey, we want to change, we want to change that we need to get in there and support them. And that's what I'm hearing out from you somehow. And it's not stupid at all. Um, I, I really just... Um, 
we're all on the same planet. We're all on the same spaceship Earth, moving in the same direction. There's none of us dropped off on, on this planet. Um, uh, whether we're indigenous, whether we're from Germany, from India, from Africa, we're all on the same planet, moving in the same direction. And we need uh, a world that works for everyone and not just a few because uh, underneath, we're all distant cousins. We're all related. We're all the same species. And the, this uh, sense that I've been feeling in many others is this sense of unease and unrest that our current civilization framework models that we see around the world are just not working for us anymore. And I, I'm a big fan of Carl Sagan. And he said, you know, uh, there's a rising collective consciousness that sees the world as the earth as one single organism and an organism divided amongst itself or at war with itself is doomed. And, and I truly feel that um, that with all the other in, 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 in inequities in our, in our world and uh, civilization frameworks is really bubbling to the surface and uh, that leads me to the question, uh, you've kind of answered it in one respect, what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? Great question. I think the first thing is to realize that for the last 500 years, the world hasn't worked. It's just that we've been like a frog in a pot. And yeah. now we realize the water is pretty dang hot. The solutions are everywhere and it's so simple it's like i mean we're doing a lot of talking right now but like the solution is listening you know and you as a podcast host do a heck of a lot of listening um the solutions are all in listening it's all in realizing that if you believe in anything in this world you have to believe in the interconnectedness of everything and if you just choose to look at it from the economic or physical standpoint, great. But if you wanna look at it from a molecular standpoint, you understand that there are kind of quantum effects with everything that everybody does, particularly when you look at human beings and the earth as a system. If you wanna look on the spiritual connect, spiritual level, you know, I'm from India, like we believe that there is a universal consciousness and that consciousness is expressing itself through every sentient and non-sentient being. Those of us who believe that have the greater task of understanding the depth of what that means and that this consciousness does exist in every other human being. And once we realize that there's a part of us in a part of everybody, it's a lot harder to be a bad person. I think we've existed in a space for so many thousands of years where individual actions don't really have a huge lasting effect. We've seen in the last few hundred that certain individuals can change the course more often than not in a negative way for thousands or millions of people. And that's not just like the great, like, you know, like autocrats of the last century. Um, it's greed, it's CEOs, it's people who come up with what we think is a world changing idea like Facebook, but whose primary motivations are so opaque even to themselves that it just ends up fitting into a force of destruction. You know, in this day and age, everybody matters more than they ever have. And I think that's a beautiful thing. But I think that as human beings, we are forced maybe for the first time in our existence to value life. Life is no longer cheap. It's like we read about all these horrors of, of you know, thousands of people dying in a tsunami um, from like 500 years ago. It's like, ho-hum, those things probably happened, you know, quite often. But now when that happens, you know, when there's a, a, an environmental disaster in Texas, 
we have a heart. We feel that pain. We can understand it. And I think we have to build on that. We have to cherish the fact that we do have those connections. And I think that's what's going to take humanity into the ne- you know, fully into the next millennium. For sure. What, what are some things that maybe are, are coming down the, the pipe or down the line for you, some new projects that you're working on, anything that you can tease or tickle and, and get us excited about to, to be looking forward from you? So I, I'm in a weird world. Like my first film was was on food. My second film was on ultra ultra distance running with a very strong indigenous aspect. I mean, this is a little bonkers, but it's completely true that humanity's first religion, first religious practice, um, you know, incorporated running. Yes, there was there was prayer, there was dance. But the most powerful forms of prayer were in dance, were in motion. And there is a deep connection that we have to Mother Earth. Um, It's just in the last few hundred years, that sense of connectivity has disappeared. But imagine running for days to catch animals. Imagine walking for months to follow the crop cycles as nomadic indigenous people did. Imagine going on thousand mile pilgrimages once every few years, which a handful of people, you know, particularly in Spain and in India and Tibet still undertake. There's beauty and physicality. And so like I did a food movie, I did a running movie, did a food movie gather. My next movie is gonna be on running. I also find that to kind of revisit these larger like macro level issues, I need to spend a few years focusing on the completely micro set of circumstances on individuals and then systems and then individuals and then systems. That's great. Is there um, any specific ways besides going out to um, the places that I will list in the description of the show notes to, to view the documentary that we should go do, be aware of, get involved, how to help support you, but as well as the indigenous natives. And uh, just in general, if we're not from the United States or in the United States, how can we uh, um, maybe do something to support or raise awareness to bring it back to our own situations? Thank you. That I'll, I'll list three things in order of ease. Number one, watch the movie. If you're in the US, Canada, or UK, it's on Amazon and iTunes. And if you're anywhere else, it's on Vimeo On Demand. Number two, go to firstnations.org, which is our primary partner in Indian country in the United States. They're doing incredible work for the 574 federally recognized tribes and a number of other groups that don't have that political recognition. Um, give a dollar, give a euro, give a pound, everything helps and it's super easy to do. Like the easiest way to affect things this day, this day and age when it comes to inequity is to redistribute the wealth. You know, it's going to take a long time before wealth through the supply chain hits these marginalized communities, but it's very easy to send a dollar or two in that direction. And then number three, if you want to do the work figure out what the most local personal issue is. Things that are tangible, not gigantic issues, but like things that have people standing on soapboxes ranting about pain in your local food community and how to address that, whether it's through food banks, whether it's through supporting local kitchens and always, always, always putting a human face to things. Not thinking about things in terms of food waste or climate change, but making it even more specific. You know, food waste and the way to redistribute that to this neighborhood in your city. You know, super localized food waste within an institution, a university, and another way to redistribute that to lower income people on a campus, et cetera. It's like, Who cares about how many millions of tons of stuff is wasted all around the world? Figure out what's happening within a few blocks or a few miles or kilometers of you 
and focus there. You know, the big picture ideas are such a waste of time where there are so many things in so many ways that you can be of service to the people in your community. So those are definitely things that we'll do. We'll list them in the show notes in the description. My last three questions for you are kind of almost on, on, on the flip side of that, something that uh, a takeaway for my listeners, maybe some insights and advice that you could give them. Uh, the first one is, is if there was one message that you could really depart to my listeners that would uh, be considered a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life, what would it be your message? I, I would say, if you're able to take regular walks, go for regular runs, you know, as much as I want you to listen to Mark's podcast on those walks or runs, unplug, get to learn more about your ecosystem through your feet, through your eyes, through your ears. We tend to become stronger fighters when we develop a much stronger connection to our local neighborhoods. You know, get to know the trees, get to know the birds, get to know the animals, the water systems on a deeply personal level, start having those types of contemplative experiences. Because when you have those experiences, you develop a connection on a much deeper level. And if somebody ever tries to take that away from you, I guarantee you, you will fight like the Dickens. That's 1% of what indigenous communities go through when they see their land being desecrated or taken. It's not just the, the history of their ancestors on that land. It's the connection that their culture has instilled in them through practice, their intimate knowledge of that land. So that's what I would suggest. Breathe the air, get your feet dirty, get your hands dirty, meander, and make that a regular practice. Love that. That's beautiful. What should young innovators in your field, filmmaking, uh, be thinking about if they're looking for ways to make real impact? Find a really good story about people. Again, it's like, I can't tell you how, again, I'm being a snob here, how sick I am of like all the media out there about like, you know, particular resources, whether it's plastic, whether it's this or that. It's like, yeah, like these, the global problems are big and they're important, but I guarantee you more people developed uh, a connection to the environmental movement by walking, watching that octopus movie. It's like by, oh, yeah. by making a connection to life, you know, making a connection to something that affects us on an incredibly deep level. And it never comes from anybody telling you, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad. You're all gonna die. I mean, that's the beauty about Gather. It's like the folks in the film are literally living on the other side of the apocalypse where their ancestors were, were decimated. You know, their land was desecrated, but they find strength in their relationship with mother earth. We're really, we really don't care about mother earth as much as we care about ourselves. Mother earth is always gonna go on. Even all the nuclear weapons wouldn't destroy this planet. And I think it's important to understand that like our issues around climate change are really quite selfish right? We want to ensure our own survival. No one really cares about that octopus. You know, if, if it was like a choice of New York City living and thriving or like an octopus living or thriving, like no one's going to choose the octopus. So it's beginning to understand how to make our motivations really focusing on earth on Mother Earth, and that's only gonna come through developing your own personal connection with it. And realizing that at the end of the day, we are all so insignificant, but at the same time, if everybody developed that feeling of insignificance, all the solutions would, would come to the fore. And so it's this like this Western drive, 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 the urgency, like the gut, the power, 
that maybe isn't the best approach. We've been talking and trying to fight for these solutions for decades now. I think the ultimate solution is going to be on the individual level. So as we practice this globalist worldview, you know, make sure you focus on yourself. Make sure you focus on really walking the walk and deepening that connection, which we all talk about is as precious as one can imagine. I, I love how the, the two that, you know, the answer you gave before this one really ties so nicely to this one, because if you make that connection back with your community, your environment, with nature, take a walk, get, go barefoot, look at the trees, see your surroundings, uh, reconnect with the earth, which basically you're saying, um, then, then you do care more about that octopus in that next step. Then you do make it more personal. It's a lot harder to not care if you've made that connection. But if, they're, if we're desensitized and we don't make that connection, it, for me anyway, it just seems a lot harder or a lot easier to just, oh, it's not a big deal. You know, it's a, a, a thing. But if you do that, there, there's that learning. And the last question really is, what have you experienced or learned in, in your professional journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start? You know, that's a great question. And I'm sure there's plenty of, your, plenty of listeners who already practice this in their day-to-day -day life. But, you know, I think most of us as kids felt a much stronger connection to nature than we do now. It was just freer. Like you could run around barefoot in your undies, whether you lived on a sidewalk or you lived on a farm. You know, Mother Earth is under that dirt. Mother Earth is under that sidewalk as well. As we grow older, we tend to focus more on comfort. And for whatever reason, the more comfortable we get, the more, the fewer calluses. We, uh, we maintain on our feet, on our hands, et cetera. And so it really took movie making, like this really technical work that's focused on a piece of technology for me to really get to spend a lot more time on fe feeling my connection to earth. I mean, I traveled a lot, I was in jungles and deserts, but I wasn't really, really there. It's like, I was doing work, I was, you know, moving earth around, moving things around, but I never really developed a sense of where I was in that moment. And I try to do more of that now on my daily runs or my daily walks. I try to have much more consciousness of the geography I'm in. Um, and that's been a beautiful thing. I think that I'm blessed to be in that frame of mind again. Um, and I, I would encourage folks who might not be, you know, in their 40s, 50s, 60s, or 70s, um, who are kind of in the hustle bustle of life to make sure that you don't lose that. The last thing is kind of my my personal thing that I wanted to, to mention with you, and then I'll, I'll let you go. It can open up a whole another world. And so I don't want to go too deep. Uh, but I want to get your views and opinions. What it is, is for, for many years, um, I just feel like most of the media that we see out there is very dystopian. Most of what we're bombarded with, not just social media, but movies and TV series, is very dystopian depictions of the future, black mirrors and 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 on and on. Um, I I <clears throat> I'm wondering when, when I was younger, when may, hopefully when you were younger as well, we had uh, Gene Roddenberry, we had Star Trek, we had these sci-fi visions of the future. It showed uh, interracial couples, they showed no smoking scenes, they showed fu these future technologies and innovations. Really sci-fi, but cool. It was something that was inspiring. And as a kid or as a youth, you'd say, oh, wow, that'd be cool. I'd love to have that. And over the years, to me, it seemed like we had architects, creatives, engineers, designers, and even movie makers doing film magic to create those kind of futures. And, and most of them have come to reality. What if we took even the sustainable development goals or uh, the Paris Agreement or say, hey, let's do media that depicts what a sustainable future looks like or what a resilient future looks like or a regenerative 
future looks like in 2030 or 2050 uh, and create a TV series or create something that's constantly showing us what that future that we should be trying to work towards getting towards even looks like so that we can begin to create, engineer and design for that. And so I, I hope you get where I'm going with my question, what I'm trying to, um, do you see media like that coming about? What, what do we need to do to create more of it? So it's bombarding us just as much as all the dystopian images. And maybe you believe that that would inspire people to say, hey, now I get it. I, that, that looks and feels like a wonderful future. Let's create that economy, that system, that those things so that we can achieve it and get there. I mean, I, I would argue that we're already there. Like five years ago, much less 10 years ago, there weren't podcasts like this where you could just listen to people having a positive, constructive conversation. I think there's, a, there's been a lot bigger focus on this idea of solutions-based media on, on more positive imagery and inspiration within cinema the last five or 10 years. And there's, and there's plenty of examples, but I, again, I, I can think of no greater example than the prevalence of, or the power of like email newsletters, the power of Instagram, which is obviously a lot more positive than, than Facebook, that's focusing on sharing, you know, inspiring, motivating content and podcasts, you know, which, you know, for the most part need to be inspirational i mean there's great ones obviously that are based on storytelling um but for the most part they're motivating they're inspirational they're really addressing the sliver of humanity that is interested in either deep dives big pushes to dispel ignorance or like solid doses of inspiration so i i love where we are right now and i i love the trends of where things are pushing forward uh, I was kind of hoping more uh, movie magic where, you know, somehow we we depict these futures. That, uh, I always think, what what would it look like? Well, it looked like when I grew up, uh, when I was younger, maybe. Uh, um, you look, know, how a, boring would that be? <laughs> it's, it's a lot more difficult to do now because there's been such a tremendous consolidation at the very, very top amongst these massive streaming platforms that are global and find that more, I mean, you see this year changing drastically year by year, more often than not, they can satiate people through middle of the road content. There's no real artistic need or impetus for really taking a very, very big risk because for the most part, because the market's not there. That said, you know, one could argue that you know, with the kind of like reinvention of television, there are tons and tons and tons of like really great long form episodic work. But to your comment, I think the fact that so there's so many choices, it's really hard for that one Star Trek, again, which was just on for a handful of years. So it's not like it was a commercial success. It, there's there's, there isn't the opportunity for that like one little tiny show, that one sliver of like futurism to all of a sudden be what everybody around the world watches. Because instead of just having three or four channels, we literally have like 10,000 when you look at all the streaming options yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. So it's just a different media landscape. Um, and, you know, if to extrapolate on your point, a lot of the futuristic Stuff that we're watching is so fantasy based superhero movies where it's like the most powerful woman that anybody could think of is like Wonder Woman or Captain Marvel and like you know the most powerful man that anybody could think of is some billionaire in an iron suit Iron Man so it's much less rooted in 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 reality I mean hopefully that'll change um, and hopefully that kind of human creative spirit will push past the commercialism of media these days Thank you so much, Sanjay. It's been absolutely wonderful. That's all I have for you, unless you want to ask me something, but it's been a sheer pleasure. 
and I hope we can follow up with your next projects very soon. I would really appreciate that. Mark, it's been great to spend this time with you. You're obviously a legend. You know, so many friends of mine were like, oh my God, Mark Buckley, he's great. He's super kind. He's super focused. And I experience, I got to experience that a thousand fold. So thank you. Thank you so much. And you, ha you have a wonderful day. And I, 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 we'll put it all in the links uh, in the show description so that everybody can go out and reach you and find your work. Thank you. Great that much. Thank you. Thank you.